goods and how it is transmitted dr shala was making her points and uh we had to take a hand washing break <laughs> much like you said it was something we did quite frequently during covid but it feels as though persons find it hard keeping up this basic hygiene and sanitation practices well i think that a lot of people don't understand um how important it is to wash your hands regularly it looks so normal it looks so trivial what's the big thing yeah what's the big deal very trivial but it actually helps because um, we pass germs through our hands a lot through contacts so um i i was saying that i wish that the way we were able to get the population aware of the importance of hand washing during covid and because people are afraid for their lives they were doing it we need to do that and maintain it as a culture um, it will it go a long way in prevention of so many diseases. Let me come to you, Dr. Obina. Okay. It's also from some of the concerns people get hung up on details they see when they say it's type this, it's type that, it's yeah. more severe. Can you kindly throw some light on the kind of uh, subtype discovered in the current cholera outbreak? Okay, um, so the thing is, uh, you know, what has been reported, you know, people have read things in the papers and stuff. They use the term subtype, but actually it is actually a serotype. That's the more technical term. Uh, so the serotype is basically how you distinguish what is the organism, the particular bacteria that is causing the cholera. And we know that the bacteria is called vibrocholerae. So that vibrocholerae, there are different types in quote, but the, like I said, the, techni the technical term is called serotype. So in this one now that they've identified through testing, they found out that the serotype is O1. So this O1 now is the one that has been detected and it is the type that causes this severe diarrhea that we see that manifests, you know, passing a lot of stool and all that. There are different types, remember, but this is the type that is usually implicated in outbreaks because now you are seeing many people catch it. So that's why we said it is the serotype now that we're talking about, which is that O1. So again, like she said, it's not details that people need to know. But when people read these things, we just want to try and let them understand that there are various types of that bacteria. However, this is the particular one that is causing this outbreak, the O1 serotype. Now, so Dr. Shola had sent me a health advisory as well. I'd just like for you to expand the conversation because you mentioned one symptom, which is diarrhea, passing of watery stool. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times people just say it's, uh, it's the beans I ate from yabasira and they don't take it too serious they go to the over the counter and they get flagile and they swallow yeah uh, what's your thought on this practice nigerians have made a habit over time well uh, i mean i would say that this is more of a social behavioral thing um thinking about how it is easy to just get over the counter medicines and just take them and help you and then you keep moving but in reality self-medication is not helpful we want to try to let people know that it's not the right thing to do. Basically, the best thing would be go to a health center and get tested. Know what is disturbing you. Know what is actually affecting you. So when people do this, and um, it's very rampant, that's the truth. That's the reality we live in. People will think about the high costs for treatment in a hospital. Probably they don't want to see themselves as, oh, I, I won't be able to care for my family, provide for them, and I just want something quick and be able to take care of myself. But the reality is that for you to be able to detect and diagnose, know what the illness is, is the first step. So when people do these treatments and it doesn't work, that is where we now have more problems. And the progression of the disease may get worse. And by the time it's worse and it may be too late, the, you know, complications come in and that's when it's severe. So by and large, what we're saying is when you don't seem to get well, you have the diarrhea and so many things, just try, take yourself to a health facility, talk to a healthcare worker, let them diagnose you. There are tests to check these things. They can test the poop, like she said, and once they find it, they will know that this is cholera. And again, even though people may see the signs and you can say, okay, I'll do it, but the only way to confirm is when they do a test. Once they find that bacteria, that vibrocholerae, we know. But again, the signs, I, I don't know if we can now go into the signs. You sure, know. we can. Before we go yeah. into the signs, I was going to say that just an add on to what um, Obina was say, yeah. saying, there is no way that a, no, a common person that is not a doctor or a medical lab scientist, anybody really, would know that. Oh, I'm stolen. Oh, this is cholera. Mm. There's no way you will know. You yeah. just know that 
you are stolen and you are feeling weak. Yeah. Which is very, that's one of the things you mention when we, we start talking about the sign. Yeah. So don't wait until you get very weak. Once you start stooling. Once you start stooling and you say that you're really stooling, get to the hospital because it just might be cholera. Yeah. It's until the, the diagnosis is done, right? Yeah, yeah. That they confirm. Yeah. That, yes, this is my, um, cholera. But you wouldn't know. So don't wait in your house until you... Because it's it's rapidly fatal. Yeah. In other words, within hours... Within hours. Within hours, within people can hours, die. Yes. Not From the symptoms, right? Within hours. People can die. Yes. Yes, yes that's severe. Yeah. Yes. Now, now, let's talk about some other signs and symptoms to look out for apart from watery stool or diarrhea. Yeah. Okay, so, but coming back to the diarrhea, one of the things you can see is that, like she said, acute, meaning it is rapid. It's happening immediately. Person is passing out so much water. The water is coming and it looks like uh, water that you used to wash rice, like rice mm -hmm. water. It's pale and looking milky. Then after the diarrhea, remember, the person is losing a lot of fluids. So with that, the person is losing glucose looking losing the salts yeah, so. minerals in the body and over time the person becomes weak so there's fatigue then you're talking about the vomiting vomiting is also rapid and very quick and it happens very very frequently in the early hours so, so within a few hours the person is just continuously vomiting vomiting yeah, vomiting now you can see the diarrhea and the vomiting loss of fluids is happening on both ends through the mouth and through the bum bum and then again what will now set in is dehydration so there's loss of water now the person is now maybe thirsty the person is weak and from that dehydration how you can tell when somebody is severely de dehydrated if you try to pick the skin of the person it's kind of not supple and looking you know fresh it's dry and shriveled and when you pick the skin up it stays it's, instead of coming down immediately it, it kind of there. takes its time to come down these are the you know severe signs then for infants less than 18 months there's this soft spot on the top of the head we call a fontanel just before one and a half years it, you once you put your hand in the center of the head of the baby it's kind of soft so once that thing is sunken it's called a fontanel if it is sunken that is when you see the baby also showing those signs that is how you can tell that that baby too is severely dehydrated mm -hmm. then the question will be can we know what is causing the dehydration? And if maybe they test the stool or something and they find the cholera bacteria, then you've confirmed that the cholera is the cause of this dehydration because the babies. So these are the major signs that we see in cholera. Now he has brought us to another important question, hence the need for this topic. Yeah. Beyond babies, now we have children of school age who definitely play with their peers in school. Uh, the symptoms, how can we prevent such children who are very, very vulnerable from coming down with cholera in schools where you know they're going to be crowded, uh, they're going to be playing with one another, there needs to be more supervision when they go to the toilet. How do we ensure that schools also take the initiative to ensure that some safety measures are on ground? Uh, so you remember what I said about hand washing? Um, they can use, um, they have some schools, private schools will have the sinks and all that. Um, some will have the buckets that have taps. To be tabs. Yes. Yeah. And uh, the buckets don't wash in a bowl don't put the water and wash in a bowl no you have to wash in running water and they have to encourage the children to do that they can't separate the children and once you notice that a child is going to the toilet often usually the child will say initially and my tummy my tummy i'm going to toilets once you see it's getting more frequent quickly call the parents and at the same time start planning to take that child to the hospital the nearest hospital to check. And while everybody is at risk of getting cholera, children are a bit more um, vulnerable yeah. to it because of the way their bodies are orientated. So they tend to um, get more adverse if, um, effects yeah. faster yeah. when they start becoming dehydrated. And you don't wait until it becomes severe. I keep emphasizing this. Please don't wait until it becomes severe. Once you see, you're going to sell it three, four, then there's vom vomiting. Yeah. Get to the hospital so immediately. Quickly. It just might be ordinary beans, like you said. <laughs> and it might be more severe, but until they check you, you wouldn't know. Yeah. So the schools should set up those um, buckets with water, encourage the children to wash frequently, 
take bricks, hand washing bricks, like we did just now, and get the children to wash their hands, including the teachers and the carers. Because sometimes they focus on the children, they forget the teachers and the carers, and everybody comes from different places. You don't know who they've been in contact with, you don't know what they've eaten, mm -hmm. you don't know what they've touched, you don't know where they've been, and then they all come together. Yeah. So it should be all personnel in the school. Like that, and that is encouraged now quite importantly we'd look at some infographics this morning in lagos state uh under the broad topic of war against cholera there's issues with vaccine shortage poor hygiene is said to be worsening the epidemic in nigeria uh, experts are warning of a public health emergency with a call for improved hygiene practices now street vendors have also been brought into this conversation who are said to be putting consumers at risk now, unrelated is also the Lassa fever concern, but you see those pictures now, children drinking from quite deplorable water conditions. Now, and there, there, there's also the concern of some unsanitized drinks, much like the likes of Zobo. Mm -hmm. We hear in Lagos, the Kunu has also been added into it. Yeah. There's now the issue with uh, tiger knots as well. Uh, it, it's a lot to look out for, and this is some of the... The beverages that parents use to pack lunch boxes to schools to yeah. send children to school. Uh, Dr. Obina, yeah. on some of these uh, drinks that have been listed now in terms of curbing the fight against cholera, mm. how do caregivers uh, begin to re strategize how their children eat in school and whatnot? Uh, this is a very tricky question. Um, I mean, we can't really control the people who produce these things out there. So as much as possible, the due diligence has to come from the carers of these children. Um, whatever the source where you get, you know, your beverages that you give, maybe you need to do some little bit of snooping around and sort of really finding out that the materials being used are prepared safely, that they used clean water, and the packaging is also intact. Many times, these packagings may be also intact from the production sites, maybe some brands that are very, very uh, authentic, let me use the word. And then perhaps in transportation and storage, these things get tampered with. That is why you normally see if they tell you you're buying something and they say the, the cover is tampered with, mm -hmm. don't use it. Because that break in the seal has given the opportunity for uh, bacteria and other infectious agents to go in. So... Uh, even when you are preparing it in at home. So some people will say, okay, I don't have that luxury of buying outside. I can prepare this myself. There are people who have learned that art in, you know, in culinary schools and the like. They make these things at home. It is of utmost importance that strict hygienic practices are maintained. We've talked about the hand washing. We've talked about washing uh, washing those materials that you use, the bottles, the, 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 the spoons, the mugs, whatever you use boiling the water ensuring that the water is boiled when when we talk about boiling water not many people may even remember that it is until you see vapor coming out of the water that's it's steam, boiled. that means it is boiled so people just think when it is hot the water is boiled that's not boiled water boiled water is until you see the water bubbling bubbles are coming out and then there's the steam that is when the water is boiled so the 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 materials used to make these things the leaves the the fruits Washing them with salt is very, very much advised. Not just putting it in water and leaving it. Leave it to soak for a bit, wash it in salt water, then take it out. Ensure that the containers where you keep them are so clean and safe, covered, you know, away from dust and agents. And like we said, uh, when it comes to children, if you have them around that kind of setting, they are playful in nature. They, they usually put their hands on the ground. This is why we say carers of children in kindergartens in crutches and so on they feed these children they're the ones who come in close contact with them the hygiene is of one of the of the highest level you can ever think of so at all levels it's just trying to say people should be vigilant to a great extent what is it that you can do to minimize contamination and that is what we are saying practice your safe hygiene practice your hand washing you know environmental hygiene is also important uh, making sure that your access to water is clean avoiding tampered with uh, bottles and the like. For instance, people go to wedding events. Maybe they have that big drum with ice and put all the drinks, whether it is canned, bottle, whatever, pure water bags and so on. When people just dip hands into those things and pick it out, for example, the pure water, the water around it it's could contaminated. be contaminated because there are so many hands going in and you just tear the thing and start drinking. You may have also taken the external water that is in there. 
So these are the things people need to understand. And when they think back, I say, how did this happen to me? It may not really be the food that you ate. Naturally, some foods will make you have runny tummy. But then you ask yourself, did I ingest something like this? These are these points people need. Even they can't drink. When you buy it from a supermarket and you see a stain around this thing, you don't just take it and keep it in your fridge. So people just clean take their, their exactly. clothes and they just <laughs> wipe. <laughs> so use something, maybe put it under water, wash it, make it dry, and then, you know, put it in the fridge, ensure that it's kept there. You take it out, uh, you'll be fine. You know, these are the things to do. I want to say two things. <laughs> I want to say that it's not just the beverages, even the fruits that we buy yeah. from food and vendors on the streets. Um, for this period, it might be better to, one, either go for the whole fruit, not the cut ones, mm -hmm. or when you buy the cut ones, don't eat immediately. Go and wash it again yourself. Go and rinse it again with your own water. That's one. The other thing I want to say, which might sound very, but I'm speaking as a mother now. I mean, in this period, avoid buying Zobo. Or I know the Zobo sellers are need to cut my throat. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the truth. Just, just give water to the child. Because you're looking at, oh, there's an, there's a, a, an epidemic of cholera mm, outbreak. Mm. So for this period, let me just, for safety. Yeah. Soon it will pass, all things being equal, and then you can come. Then we can return to tiger knots and zoba yes, and whatnot with safety. with safety, with safety. safety. You don't just you make it yourself and keep in the yeah. house. And if you know you can't, and you don't trust, you don't, you're not sure of the source. Yeah. Why are you giving your child that? You give your child water. Now another issue that has stemmed beyond children of school age is the challenge with vaccines. There's been word around the streets. Some people are saying only private hospitals have these vaccines now. Uh, when you bet children, how do we ensure that the children have the first cholera vaccine they're supposed to take? I'll get your thoughts and then I'll come to you as well. Okay. Uh, so first of all, um, it would have been good if the cholera vaccine was among our routine immunization vaccines. Uh, routine meaning that the government provides for it and it is supposed to be free of charge in public health facilities. So any government-owned health facility, you can walk there and get uh, the vaccine for free. But the cholera vaccine is not like that. It's not free. It's not yet part of the routine immunization vaccines. So these are vaccines that uh, the country needs to get from donors, international organizations like WHO, uh, who can provide for them. And it is the country that will make the request before it comes into the country. Then our Federal Minister of Health through NPHCDA, because they are the, the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency. They are the agency responsible for all vaccinations in the country. So through them, then states will be able to get the vaccines depending on the need. So for now, like you said, you can get them, you know, through private institutions, private institutions. And, and, you know, their costs. I, I wouldn't know how much they cost right now, but to the common man, I'm sure he would have to burn a hole in his pocket to be able to get that, which is why we're saying when it comes to vaccines, I wouldn't want people to think much about the vaccine, but rather think about preventing it. measures. Because as we hear these things every now and then, prevention is better than Thank you. you. So it is until a disease hits, then you now realize the implications to your costs, to your welfare, to you. people not having sleepless nights if they themselves or a child is sick, the, the visits you have to take to hospital, the strain it puts on you to care for somebody who is extremely sick. You can imagine somebody who is vomiting and, and, and having diarrhea at the same time. It is even in those situations that the hygienic uh, conditions are even worse. And that is why we say when it comes to preventing it's something we need to take seriously to the heart because somebody who has cholera in a household has the potential to spread it to other people. And there are some people who don't show cholera. Yeah. One to 10 days, no symptoms yeah, or my symptoms, yeah. just a slight stomach pain, nothing happens. But as they do their business to the toilet and per perhaps they don't have good uh, hygienic measures, they don't wash their hands. Imagine that person coming out touching materials, touching things that children can touch, be probably being part of the food making process in the house, passes it on and before you know. So I would really emphasize on the fact that there is treatment for cholera. The vaccine is more of a preventive measure. So somebody has not had cholera, you give the person the vaccine to prevent it later on. However, the, the immunity from cholera doesn't last too long. So why bother about the vaccine? vaccine. Let's focus on preventive measures. What are the simple things, the personal hygiene measures you can take? 
environmental hygiene and the likes access to having drinking water we we're, we we're just talking earlier that how did this cholera even come to light who was the first person who made us realize the connection between contaminated water or food and the cholera disease a man called john snow sometime in the 18 something in england yeah. there People was an outbreak. game of thrones now <laughs> <laughs> so there was an outbreak in london at the time and they were you know confused people showing those symptoms and all of a sudden he just looked at the tap where a particular water source of water kept coming out and he was like let's just do some little engineering remove the tap ensure that the water doesn't flow out again and before you know the symptoms of cholera started going down in the population and everybody now started pointing fingers towards oh so this water was the source of it so i'm really hoping that you know our field epidemiologists out there everybody is putting their best foot you know in lagos state trying to find out what is the source of this infection because when we now find the source we can be able to quickly nip it in the bud most of the time cholera is mostly an environmental or you know personal hygiene issue Take care of that, and you'll be able to handle, you know, the cholera. So, yeah, that's my that's my thought. Doctor, on the angle of uh, water sources, like he cited the John Snow scenario in schools, more so the private schools don't have much of these challenges. Community schools, public schools, you have cited the need for TP tap running water for them to wash their hand is also on the water they ingest. And we keep referring to that front page with children drinking from stream water and there's also the issue of open defecation yeah. even in the fct the other day i was telling oh, a colleague bad. you find people literally on, on the highways yeah. especially now with the rainy season with the rainy seasons yes. as well and the water the rain washes it and can wash it because yeah. it's part of what flows into wells that are being used exactly um, boreholes are not deep enough yeah so you are pumping it to use in your house and because it's looking clean you're thinking you know Oh yeah, this is fine. So there has to be an emphasis on boiling water before drinking in the homes, um, especially when you know that you cannot afford uh, bottled water yeah. or water that has been proven to be um, safe. to be safe. Yeah. So there should be an emphasis on boiling water. And when you boil water, Obina mentioned it a bit earlier about boiling water, making sure that the bubbles are forming, yeah. the steam is coming out, and then you time it. From that time, the bubbles come out. You actually time it for like seven minutes to be properly boiled then you can let it cool down pour it into bottles to be clean containers yeah. and those are the kind of things we should encourage children to do. well we know that you know there will always be the mothers that are not watching the tv the mothers that are not listening to, because they're caught up in they're getting money to even cater for the children for the family the fathers that their, their mind is not here their mind is not so that's why it would be good you know to um let the teachers know the proprietresses the, the association to be aware that there's a cholera outbreak and check the kind of water the children are bringing to school encourage them when they bring in the pure water before they open it to wash it in the running water that they have to wash mm -hmm. hands and that kind of thing just to make sure that they're just a little bit extra precautions yeah, to prevent it yes to prevent it um, mm -hmm. as much as possible now we also advise that you visit the ncdc website for more information and we'll be sharing more on this topic this morning we'll take a short break and when we return we'll look at uh, some of the home remedies boiling water has been highlighted we'll also look at uh, some of the solutions that uh, schools can have on ground we're looking at it from the angle of some cholera kits what constitutes a cholera kit and uh, is there a need for such in some uh, dispensaries. I don't know if we have dispensaries anymore in our schools, but it used to be, be a thing in the late 80s and early 90s. When we come back from that break, as we wrap up this conversation this morning, we'll just have more professional insights on these topics. Stay with us. Well, the NCDC has declared a state of emergency following the current cholera outbreak in Nigeria, with 31 states having recorded over 1,594 cases. The death toll has hit 53 in Lagos alone. 29 fatalities were recorded. This morning on the show, as a very proactive step, we're looking at susceptible groups of individuals who are largely of the demographic of children. And one of those places they come in contact with a larger number of their peers is in schools. Now we're looking at it from the angle of safety and hygiene in schools. On the show this morning, I still have Dr. Shola and Dr. Obina with me. And before the break, we're talking about, you know, finding information online and understanding what it is 
the information zone should schools have cholera kits people are saying no cholera kits should not be for schools they should be for <laughs> frontline workers please could we put this straight yeah, shall I, maybe you take this okay so <laughs> I, I think it's important to stress that for example the unicef and um, cholera kit contains um different things it contains personal protective um, equipment for the health worker not for the teachers or the students it contains a diagnostic t um, test kit mm -hmm. for the health worker it contains um, rehydration salts, oral rehydration salts. We'll talk a bit more about that. Yeah. <coughs> Again, for the health, health worker to administer, yeah. it contains antibiotics where you feel that antibiotics are necessary, where it has reached that point for the health worker. Uh, what else? The, uh, the, the cholera test itself. Yes. And there may be some <coughs> stethoscope, blah, 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 to just check. It's actually for the health worker. And not for schools. No. So the, the kids are being sent to the states to make sure that they have, they are ready and prepared they have for a any stock. cholera mm -hmm. case that may come on to be able to diagnose and treat fast. Yeah. Because remember we said that it can kill in hours. Mm -hmm. That's why we are so like, we need to have enough kids because we don't know where we might need it and all that. So it's not for the children to have it in the schools. Just get your yourself to the health facility as soon as you are even thinking ah, i'm still you know quickly quickly go and check and let them tell you oh don't worry this is just mild don't worry you're fine mm -hmm. and or let them tell you ah, it's cholera let's just quickly get you rehydrated yeah let me come to you on the treatment as well. or you want to add just to add to that so some schools can also have dispensaries or health clinics so of course it is the health workers there that should get the kids that's why you have them close so that if there's any child that has an issue, they can quickly go to that uh, health facility where they will now get the kids. So yes, it is for the healthcare worker to administer or a trained personnel who can be able to administer the kids, prepare the uh, oral rehydration solution and so on. It, I think it even has some antibiotics. Yeah. However, the test, like we said, you can see the signs and you can say, oh, this person may likely have, but you need to confirm it which is why in that kit, there's a test in it. I think uh, th th some states have received uh, stock of the of the kits now, the test kits. So that test is to test the, the diarrhea. There's a rapid way it will change a color or something that will let you know that this organism created yeah, that yeah. change. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you will now be sure that it is that bacteria we talked about, the vibro cholerae. So once that is confirmed in that rapid test, then immediately start the treatment with the oral rehydration solution. And if it is very severe, then antibiotics may also come in and all that. Yeah. Now, you are talking more on the treatments that would follow as well. Uh, let's buttress it. It has to be administered by a certified health center, right? Yes, mm -hmm. health worker. You know, he mentioned earlier when talking about the symptoms, that there is vomiting and then there is diarrhea. So when you have someone that cannot even keep down fluid mm. because it's vomiting, the oral rehydration salt does not it doesn't really take effect now no. you need to get some um, IV drip. intravenous yes, intravenous get drip <coughs> for the person so that the person can be rehydrated but at home i think it's a good practice to have oral rehydration salt is available yeah. in the pharmacies so that when you you start to lean and if it's called right, it's not be enough for because there'll be vomiting but for ordinary diarrhea, you are stooling two, three, it's not really ordinary. Mild, mild symptoms. Mild symptoms. Mild symptoms. Yeah. <laughs> so it, um, it's good to start to to prepare that solution yeah. and start to see. It's actually because it contains salt, yeah. it helps the electrolyte balance, balance that mm -hmm. occurs with um, loss of fluid. Yeah. So it helps to um, balance out, helps you to absorb, and it can ease. That's even just mild diarrhea. Yeah. But by the time there is vomiting, you can't keep anything down. Yeah. You need to get to the hospital ASAP. Okay. Yeah, just to add to that as well. Um, so we're talking about how it can be mild. And sometimes some people don't show it and then there's a severe one. So in people where it is mild, you know, the oral rehydration solution can help. You constitute it hygienically, of course, using clean water and all that and the person you know drinks it whether the child or not you can even prepare it yourself you can actually make it at home rather than if you don't want to spend money you have sugar you have salt and you have a clean container before that 
again wash your hands with soap and water very well your items everything are washed decked out in the kitchen wherever you're making it then you take eight level teaspoons of uh what's it called sugar 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 we'll be reiterating this ingredients yes. as you say them i'm going to reiterate them yeah you have to Six sanitize points. the equipment, sanitize them, wash them very well. Have your salt on one hand, your yeah. sugar on one hand. Yeah. Your, water, clean water. your clean water, the mixing bowl the on mixing the side, bowl, yeah. a tablespoon, teaspoon, teaspoon, teaspoon. You and start with the sugar. Level, level, start level. With the sugar so you, it is not heaped. You don't heap it like a. You level when you fetch it. You level it. Eight of them, you pour, and then the other one is the salt. Only one. Only one of salt. Only so eight of, of sugar. Salt. Eight of sugar. Level one teaspoon. of salt. All of them level. Eight level spoons sugar. One level teaspoon salt. Pour it into the mixing bowl. Stir till it dissolves. Then you can pour it in the container and then give to the child or whoever is in the... As we, remember, we said symptoms that are mild, that can be manageable. And we time that diarrhea will phase out and then the person comes back to normal. The truth is cholera is easily treatable. We hear about the severity of the disease, but this is because it has gone really far. If these things were detected early, the personal hygiene and so on, it's easily treatable. However, now, for the ones that are severe, where you see cases that are looking very, very, uh, very devastating, in those situations, like she said, you can't do the oral rehydration anymore. They can't keep it down. It now has to go through the, 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 uh, the blood vessels, the veins, the IV drip. And the person is now giving the, the, the solution. And then the person is kept for a while until the person normalizes. And in those situations, there is usually administration of antibiotics. Remember now, I said antibiotics is in severe, not in mild. mild. So when people think about the flagell thing, it's not advised. We don't. The reason, again, being that if people are indiscriminately taking antibiotics, you will now create resistance. So when that thing comes again and you want to try and take it because you've abused that drug, that drug will no longer work. So again, in terms of cholera, we're saying it is only in severe cases, the IV and the antibiotic. The antibiotic is so that as the person is there, because it's a little time, if care is not taken, the person may die. So it's severe, remember, hours. So that antibiotic is to ensure that the bacteria in the system is killed off quickly. And because it's still in the system, the person will keep passing stool, losing water. That's why you are doing IV immediately to replace. So all this is to shorten the time of dehydration, shorten the fluid loss, and shorten the bacteria that is in the body. Kill it quickly. Because this is like serious case right now. You need immediate you know, restitution. You want the person to get well. So that's why we say IV in severe cases and usually with antibiotics. Mass administration of antibiotics is not advised for cholera. Please, nobody should do that. It, otherwise, we are going to create another problem again. Antimicrobial resistance. People will no longer be responding to, to treatment. treatment. Yes. That's what we want to avoid. Now, as we look to wrap up this conversation, it's also on a call on persons to deceased from open defecation. And if mm -hmm. possible, have schools, the government come up with well-sanitized public toilets. Let's just get that Absolutely. from you. Absolutely. I think that's one of the issues we have in Nigeria. We have a government that is not setting up toilets for people everywhere. And the truth is because there's a lot of um, a poverty, increasing poverty. Uh, there are people that they steep in their stalls in the markets, for example. They, they, steep, they steep in setting... The, they're mm -hmm. not in proper houses. You need to understand that there, that exists and make sure that there are public toilets in the marketplaces, enough in malls, enough in um, general outhouses where people linger. Just just make sure that toilets are everywhere. And for me, that's the one have any way they can employ people to make sure that those toilets are kept clean. Kept clean. Yeah. And so people don't go and destroy the toilets, but they're kept <laughs> clean. It's true. And then that would help. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I must thank you, Dr. Obina, yeah. and thank you as well, Dr. Shola, for making our time to grace the program. I'm afraid I'm going to have to let you go so you catch up with all the engagements outlined for today. Yeah. Thank you very thank much, you so Brian. Much, it's an honor to be here.